for fire, and you sort of, everybody sort of had to find their own way. And I think the best way to do that is by going out and watching people, because you sort of see the problems being solved, or you see how the things are being done. And I've thought about this lately, because I know I was going to get to talk to you guys, and I'm not going to talk so much, I'm going to do a lot more playing and talking. And, uh, but I wanted to say this because I thought, well, maybe people don't go out to the gigs as much because, you know, why well, watch Dan Balmer when you can watch Wes Montgomery or John Schofield or Pat Metheny? And, my, and I, I thought, well, I need a, a, a glib response to that. And my glib response is, you're much more likely to be a lot closer to Dan Balmer than you're going to be Wes Montgomery. I mean, those, you know, it's one thing to sort of look at our, you know, the, the real masters and kind of go, well, that's, you know, that, you know. But I mean, they're they're not solving the problems that Jimmy Max on a on a Monday night. You know, they're the great geniuses, and you see them at live at Newport or whatever. And if you get there, great. I hope so. Uh, but you know what? Most of your local musicians are doing is a little more uh, a, a part of the path you're going to go through. And so, if you don't go out to see a lot of music because you're watching YouTube and you're playing with your friends, playing with your friends is great. That's really important. But nothing really. I think. You know, as far as intros, endings, how to pace a set, you know, how to pace solo, what's interaction look like, what do people look like on the bandstand, what's effective, what isn't effective, you know, what's, you know, what, 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 what's reaching an audience, what isn't, you know, how, you know, all that stuff you really feel at the live performance. And, you know, guitar players, uh, you know, I mean, if, you know, I mean, it's, on any instrument, I spoke speak of the guitar players, but on any instrument, you know, you don't really know how a lot of your local guys play unless you've seen them three or four times. You know, it's not enough to go, well, I'm going to go out, like I played last night with Rob Davis and John Gross. And I don't know if you guys, if the other saxophone players are familiar with Rob Davis and John Gross, but they're uh, outstanding saxophone players. Just yeah, he's a yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, they're worth seeing more than once, you know, all these people are. So don't, don't kid yourself and think, oh, I don't need to go see the local guys because I'm listening to Joe Henderson on a record. Uh, it's super important to go out and see the local people and kind of be acquainted with what the scene is like. You don't want to sort of be living in your own bubble. I always tell the kids at Lewis and Clark, you know, get downtown. You know, and, and same thing here. You can't sort of have a Portland State bubble or your high school bubble. You need to be out catching the guys. And, you know, a lot of our local players are really outstanding. I was telling... Uh, drummer in the combo I was playing with today, you know, Peter Erskine, the drummer, you all know Peter Erskine? Yeah. Drummers, you know, Peter Erskine. He was in town, and he was checking out Mel Brown. And Peter said to Damien Erskine, his nephew, he said, man, this is my new favorite drummer. You know, Mel's playing five nights a week, and any drummer who hasn't gone and sat next to Mel, I mean, you know, you can learn, uh, you know, there's so much you can learn from Mel Brown. A lot of times, oh yeah, I've seen Mel, yeah, oh, I've, you know. No, I mean, you know, you, so anyway, I just want to put in a, a plug for going out and, and, uh, and uh, seeing local musicians because I really feel like that's, that's, that's what you will probably be doing uh, uh, if, you, if you follow music. You'll be going out and playing in clubs and, you know, coming up with a set list and choosing musicians and choosing songs and a style and all that. So, anyway, that's number one. Number two, I've had all my groups that I've had the pleasure of working with. And again, for those of you who come in, I want to say it's a great pleasure to be a part of this workshop, and I appreciate being invited to do it. And get to hear all you play, and it's always uh, impressive the talent of our young people, and it's always uh, gratifying the you know adults who are like in it for you know for you know, just personal joy and growth is really fun to work with too. So. Nice to be here. Uh, other thing I say is I've been having all my groups uh, play something free, and uh, each day we started off with a free tune whenever I've had a group. And uh, I played with a group called the Jazz Passengers in February at the Portland Jazz Festival. I was subbing for Mark Ribot, who's a kind of a first call New York avant-garde artist. And like I, I had this music. <laughs> It's like, you know, Eric Dolphy tunes and these crazy original tunes that they sing. It's a really crazy band. I don't know if any of you have heard of the jazz passengers, but they're sort of famous in a way. Uh, and a lot of tunes would be like, okay, Dan, you know, after we get through the head, you and I are just going to go. And it was a lot of free, you know, a lot of it was sort of free and then free within a context. And uh, uh, they also used a guy named Dave Fusinski, who's a, 
you know, another kind of first first call New York. Anyway, I got an email yesterday. And they said, you know, uh, you know, we're you know we're trying to go to Europe. You know, we don't know if we're going to be able to take a guitar, but would you like to do it? And uh, which is really nice that they would ask somebody from Portland, since they're all in New York. They would ask, and there's no lack of new guitar players in New York. That they'd ask somebody from Portland, you know, to maybe go to Europe with them. Uh, but that's like really an avant-garde gig. And so uh, when we've done our little beginning session, the groups that I've worked with are two, five or six minutes of free music. You know, that's a that's still a, an, an art form to be uh, studied. So that's that, and it's been a lot of fun to to do that. But what I want to talk about is I want to give you guys uh, my lecture on playing the playing the jazz blues. And uh, feel free to stop me at any time. A jazz blues is, uh, to me, it's it's it's, uh, it's 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 a really fascinating thing. On one level, a lot of times people go, "Oh yeah, the blues. Oh yeah, so what?" Or "Oh yeah, I can play the blues." You know. But uh, I always think back to when I was about 14 or 15, and I started playing jazz and getting into jazz. And my father was from Gresham, and he grew up. In Gresham with a guy named Floyd Standifer was one of their buddies. And Floyd Standifer was a saxophone trumpet player who was from Gresham. Uh, you know, one of the few African Americans in, you know, Portland at the time. And he's my friend of my father's. And he moved to Seattle and he played in Quincy Jones' big band and toured for two years with Quincy Jones. Because Quincy Jones was really a, a jazz big band leader before he became a mega, mega producer, you know, producing Michael Jackson records and stuff toured with Quincy Jones, and he became in Seattle a little bit like uh, Mel Brown and people like that are here, kind of a super distinguished, respected, uh, kind of old school, old school guy and top flight artist in Floyd Stanford. So when I was just getting into jazz, when I was 14 or 15, my father said, well, we need to go see Floyd. And so we went to see Floyd Stanford, and Floyd is a very gracious guy, and Floyd could tell me stories about having Wes Montgomery over for lunch. And, you know, stuff that just fascinates me to this day. And so, uh, and Floyd said, oh, you're getting into jazz. Well, then play me some blues. And I'll never forget that, because it was sort of like, oh. You know, and to anybody in there, anybody from previous generations, I mean, there's a healthy dose of, of, of blues and jazz blues in, in, uh, in jazz. And so a lot of times, um, you know, this is kind of like the building blocks of the whole thing. And playing a jazz blues is really an intriguing thing. And uh, it's something that is fascinating. And it's also, uh, you know, I don't know how much we talk about, uh, you know, the, you know, the uh, things that make us employable in, in, as players. Um, but... Uh, you know, I really came up playing sort of avant-garde music, sort of modern music and ECM type music, and and fusion music, and then pop, kind of pop jazz music. And that's, you know, I wasn't didn't really have a real strong foundation in bebop, or you know, I could play bebop sort of like a modern guy plays that stuff, and blues sort of like a modern person. And then over the course of my lifetime, uh, to keep working, and what I do for a living is I play the guitar. And so if I wanted to keep working. You know, I needed to keep adapting. You know, smooth jazz, uh, some of which is good and some of which is not good, like all music, you know, was definitely fading. <coughs> you know, sort of modern jazz, ECM jazz, was not flourishing. But what seemed to always flourish a little bit is playing in the tradition. I really believe that, you know, the jazz from the 50s and 60s will be around forever. You know, I think that'll be kind of, you know, I could be wrong. I wouldn't argue with anybody about this. Anybody can say whatever they want. But, you know, I think that that, in a lot of ways, like we go Mozart, you know, you know, you know, you know wherever it starts, you know, Bach, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, uh, Debussy, Bartok, however you want to say, you know, we'll, you know, we say these are the powerful, important periods, and they're the periods that people embrace of classical music. I think people will probably always embrace uh, kind of the 50s and 60s in jazz. Uh, because it's really, a, and, and, I, and I'm not saying that's my favorite period. I mean, my favorite period is probably always now, today. But uh, uh, I think that's the part that historically people are going to always relate to. So as being a jazz musician, I think that's an important language to speak. So what I want to talk about is playing the blues, uh, because it's a little bit of a, it's really a, a, a 
kind of a mystery in a way, and it's something everybody should be able to do. And as I talk about it, I will say why I think so. Any questions or thoughts? Okay, so I need a drummer and a bass player, maybe a piano player. You got any? Can I do it? Can I do it? Bass player? Any bass player? Somebody get me an Iranian piano player. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I need to do. Okay, let's play this top blues. Simple, simple, simple. Simple, simple, simple. They should be labeled. I should have mentioned this Thank mm -hmm. you. 